Hey you folks, Quilly Teen here and welcome to some Sid Meier Civilization 6 gameplay footage. This is a press preview build. It is a pre-release version that's not necessarily representative of the final product. 2K Games and Firaxis flew myself as well as some other YouTubers and press people out to New York City so we get a chance to play some of this. This demo was limited to I think 150 turns. We we had to play on Prince level. We got to choose between Pangea and Continent map type. I went Continent type and there were eight, eight civilizations to choose from and I picked England here. I'm playing as Victoria and it may not have been the most brilliant solution or choice because most of her abilities are actually later in the game, uh, and therefore the fact that I'm this demo is limited to 150 turns, it is being played on quick speed, by the way, uh, so you, you could get pretty far in that time, um, but probably still means I'm not going to see a lot of those effects. That being said, part of the reason for picking her was to try to get a somewhat more baseline vanilla experience for the start, um, rather than play one of the nations that had sort of an oddball or kind of quirky mechanic that really comes into play early on in the game. Uh, for example, Brazil, for example, gets, uh, as soon as you get campuses, if you're in a jungle, you get ridiculous science. Um, and that's not going to be the case here. In fact, I quite dislike this start when I started here. You're going to actually see me in a moment open up the screen, the uh, the menu, and hit the restart button to re-roll the start because I was not particularly happy with it. Um, and it turns out, again, this is a pre-release build. The restart button was not wired yet. They're like, oh, no, no, that's, yeah, that's just a button there for the UI, but it doesn't do anything yet. Um, so that's what happens when you play a game three months before it is released. So I was like, I could quit and re-roll, but you know, I was like, no, I'll keep going. Why did I not like this start? Well, two reasons. One, um, I'm not actually on the coast, and actually I'd forgotten that you don't have to be on the coast to play a maritime civilization. Because I'm like, I'm England, I'm supposed to have boats and stuff, but I'm not on the coast? What? It actually doesn't matter, because you can build the harbor district. The harbor district is where your boats come out of, and I'm well in range. In fact, this is a coastal start. I'm well in range of the actual coast, um, and I'll be able to build a harbor district, and I'll be able to build boats in London perfectly fine, even though my, my Civ Five wired brain was telling me that that was not an option. And so I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. But the other reason I wasn't very keen on this is because, or this start, is because I knew that to take advantage of campuses, which is where a lot of your early science comes from, you need a particular set of terrain, and that wasn't around in London. I wanted some mountains or something like that, ideally. But it's okay, we'll, we'll move on from there. So here I am just picking my initial technology. One of the things I'm not uh, able to do here for you guys is scroll far to the right um, under the terms of the preview thing. We couldn't show you the late game technology or the... Uh, or the, uh, the social policy tree, just because that hasn't all been announced yet, and as well as not being able to show you the Civilopedia, just because it has a lot of late game information that we weren't able to show in there. And I'll also remind you guys that all of the numbers, of course, are very much subject to change. If you see something like the monument was giving, I don't know, plus two culture or something like that, by the time this gets released, they might have it be plus three culture or plus one with some other ability or something like that. None of the numbers are fixed at all. But here we have met a city-state. Oh, um, of Jerusalem. I also want to point out that the reason you're not hearing any background sound or music is because the music would get flagged on the YouTubes. Um, and in the future, when I actually play, I'll make sure to just mute the music but keep the gameplay sounds on. So my apologies for that. But unfortunately, if you watch anyone else's YouTube video of the same thing, uh, they'll have to do uh, the same thing. Otherwise, they're going to get flagged as well, which is uh, just a reality of being a YouTuber. That's the way it goes sometimes. So Jerusalem over there has got a couple of warriors, so it's a religious city-state, and we'll be looking into city-state mechanics quite a bit in this game, and how the envoys work, which is going to be really, really exciting. Um, I think at this point I'm having a conversation with uh, one of the developers about some of them uh, lens types or something of that nature, I don't remember exactly what we're talking about, but we ran into a barbarian over here, and actually what you're going to see, the early game here is going to be very much dominated by me fighting against some very very frustrating barbarians. Uh, barbarians have a very unique mechanic in Civ 6 in that they they have a camp that is guarded by a unit just like in Civ 5 or even Civ 4. Here, here you go, there's a barbarian encampment right over there. But they also send out scouts and if the scout happens to find your city, oh there's my own scout over there, if your scout, a scout happens to find your city it then tries to run back to its barbarian encampment and let them know where it is at which point the barbarian encampment will spawn a whole type uh, set of stuff. And I knew this because I'd, I'd gotten been told that in my previous presentation when I played a, like a 60 turn demo a couple of months ago but I had forgotten and as a result, I'm actually going to let one of these scouts find my city. I'm not going to let it. It's going to, it's going to find my city whether I want it to or not. 
Uh, and then I'm gonna be in a wee bit of trouble, but that's gonna let us explore a lot of early game combat, which is gonna be, you know, plenty fine. One of the things to point out here as well is the movement rules have changed a fair bit in Civ 6 from Civ 5 and in fact Civ 4. It's actually kind of a retro thing. Um, in, let's say, it takes two movement to enter a mountain or a hill tile, for example, right? Hill or a forest. It takes two movement. Well, in Civ 5 or 4, you would be used to thinking, if you're down to, let's say you're, you've got a unit that has movement of two and you used one to move into a plane, so you have one movement left and you want to enter the forest or climb on top of the hill, in Civ 5, you'd be able to do that. But in Civ 6, you cannot. You need to have the, the required movement to enter into that tile. So you'd actually have to stop and wait until your next turn before you can move in there. And that's going to take a lot of adjustment. Again, it's kind of a throwback to, I think, at least Civ 2 or Civ 3 had that mechanic, if not both. I can't remember exactly at the top of my head. I have to go and look that up myself. But this existed in previous versions of Civ, and it's interesting to see it uh, come back here. Oh, we got a goodie hut, excellent, uh, to make a return here. But it means that a lot of your normal sort of assumption about how your army can move around is not really valid. In particular, that's gonna come up a lot later on when we get into some proper combat and some war against a neighbor. I'm not gonna tell you who and where and when, but there is going to be some warfare and that movement mechanic is really gonna be, uh, uh, it's gonna be a learning experience because I'm having to adjust a lot of my my movement strategies. There's a, another thing that you're gonna see later on with promotions that we'll talk about that's gonna have a pretty big impact in gameplay, but I'll wait until we get there. So at this point, I'm looking around here. It is worth noting that all continents have a name and this continent is actually called Australia, which is an interesting uh, place for England to start here. Um, and England's special ability later on is if you're fighting on a continent that is not your own, you actually get a big bonus to your troops' combat. Contrast that, however, with France's ability to... Now, I don't think this is just, like, in general. I think it's a particular French unit that gets a bonus when fighting on its own continent. Uh, and that's probably quite a bit more powerful than England's. But I think England is not really... I, I'm trying to remember, I don't think it's limited to a particular unit. I'll have to scroll back to the start of this video and uh, verify that myself. So I'm using my warrior here to explore, and really I should probably be keeping it at home to do some rebel stomping, or not, the barbarian stomping. Here I've accumulated enough faith, uh, I believe because I got one free envoy with Jerusalem, so I'm getting some faith from there, to pick a pantheon. And there's a lot of really good options. Here I'm looking at some landscape and trying to decide, you know, if there's a bonus that I want. Like, again, naturally with England's typical start in Civ 5, you might be like, oh, God of the Sea, because you'll probably be coastal and be ready to work the sea. But there's really not that much for London right now. So I'm trying to decide. Ultimately, I do resolve on, you know, it'd be fun. It's a low difficulty. We're only playing on Prince. How about I build some wonders? Uh, because that's not normally something you can really do on higher difficulty settings, especially not the early wonders. Um, late game wonders, sure, but early wonders usually can't compete when you're playing on Immortal or Deity difficulty, and I thought it might be fun. I'm like, oh, I'll do that, and I'll build Stonehenge. Well, soon you're going to see that actually, oops, I can't actually build Stonehenge, because just like all wonders in Civ 6, wonders are effectively a district. They have to be built on a tile, and a lot of them have rules as to where they can be built, and Stonehenge has to be built adjacent to stone, which I guess makes a lot of sense, but again, in my sort of Civ 5 brain, I'm just like, no, just build Stonehenge, it'll be fine. It turns out London can't build Stonehenge. So I don't think I ever actually get any value out of our Pantheon, unfortunately. Maybe later, I'm not sure. Oh, here we have completed our first um, social policy project, um, our code of laws. So we're able to choose uh, some actual policies to implement into our government. We're simply a tribal government right now, a chiefdom. So we only have one slot for military policies and one slot for economic policies. Later governments, which get unlocked, in fact, here in the civic tree, I suspect I'm going to scroll over to see political philosophy or something of that nature here. Uh, yeah, scroll over. There it is. Political philosophy, which unlocks the three, the first three real government types, autocracy, classical Republic and oligarchy, all of which have four slots for policies. And along the way, you're going to unlock more policy cards as well to get more control over your empire. You can change policy cards whenever you want by spending gold or anytime you complete a new social policy technology um, or code of laws or civil, civil whatever the, the name, it, name is. We just saw it on screen two seconds ago, but I've already forgotten. Whenever you develop a new one of those, like when foreign trade finishes in 16 turns here, I'll be able to shuffle all my cards around for free at that point. So you actually get to change them very, very, very frequently. Um, 
the, uh, oh yeah, you'll see this a little bit. The build we were in, the button to change production was a little bit twitchy. Um, and a couple of the buttons are a little bit offset, but again, it's a very, very early days for the UI. If you remember uh, my demo from what, was it like a month and a half ago, two months ago? They didn't even have icons in for the building. So they are really working on the UI polish step at this point. And there's been dramatic changes from the last one I've gone and there's still three months left to go. So um, I, 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 I expect the buttons will work fine by the time we get there. And it's not like they didn't work here. They're just a little bit finicky because again, you know, it's like it's like early access, but it's not even early access. This isn't even meant for public consumption at all. So this barbarian scout here has just found my city and he's gonna turn around and let his buddies know, which is gonna be really, really bad for me. So I'm like, oh man, I, I just, I, I think this is a point where I remember that. So I'm like, I better get my scout to start fighting and yeah, bring my, my warrior back home. Cause I know all of a sudden I'm in a frack ton of trouble. I'm in a huge amount of trouble because it's very unlikely I can kill the scout before it gets back to its base. I don't know which um, barbarian encampment this guy came from, but I'm, I think I'm at this point, I'm probably guessing from the south, and he seems to be walking that way. I'm like, oh, there's a camp down there, and they're going to start spamming me with barbarians, and oh, this is so bad, so bad. And in fact, that scout to the north here, I probably need to bop as well. I'm going to double mounts, and I'm like, I better start working on a warrior or a slinger. Slinger is an early range unit you do get to start off with. It only has a range of one, but it does get the ability to, you know, attack something without taking damage in return, although you don't want it itself to get attacked. There's also a bonus. If you kill something with a slinger, I think it gives you the Eureka moment towards archery as well, uh, which is a very, very nice bonus to have. Here, uh, Jerusalem has a city quest for me. He wants me to build a campus district. Campus district, uh, I suspect, again, it's too early for me to really know this properly, but I strongly suspect is going to be the primary source of science in the early game for you. And in particular, building something like a library requires you to have a campus. Effectively, in a way, you can imagine that a library is like an upgrade to a campus. Campuses don't produce anything in and of themselves. They produce things via, oh, right here. Oh, you wanna rewind that and see what happened right there. I lost my, my scout here because of the promotion system. If I'm remembering that moment correctly, it might be next turn, but I think it's right here. Yeah. Um, promotions in Civ 6. So there's no longer a healing promotion. Oh no, it's gonna happen right here. So I'm like, ah, oh, I know that if I promote my scout, it'll heal me a bunch. So I'm like, oh great. So I'll take some promotion, it'll heal me. And then I'll move away, I'll pick up the goody hut. Promotions end your turn in Civ 6. That that will cause me to lose my scout right here, but that will have massive, massive implications on attacking a city later on. It's that combined with the movement differences has completely scrambled my brain in terms of how to warfare, because you're gonna have to unlearn what you know from Civ 6 or Civ 5, because just the, the speed at which you can move and the combos you can execute are very, very different. On the other hand, catapults don't have to set up to siege anymore. They don't really have an inherent bonus to city damage, so they're sort of more of an all-purpose range unit now. But oh yeah, here I'm, I'm I'm talking to I'm talking to someone about ah oh, I just lost a scout because I forgot about this promotion ending my turn. I could have just moved away and saved him. But lesson learned. But um but yeah, when, there's going to be some combat later on, and there's going to be a lot of having to like regain the sort of flow. How do you move as a coordinated unit and not screw yourself up and, and learn those rules again? Here's another scout finding London. I'm just like, oh man, everything is terrible here. But this barbarian encampment's gonna get bopped. Fortunately, Jerusalem is gonna get the reward for having done that, uh, which is a little bit unfortunate, but it still helps to keep it a little bit clean. But there are still clearly two more barbarian encampments nearby, which is very bad news. I'm going to pick up sailing here so that we can get sailing ships as well as um, building boats and the uh, the coastal district, uh, which is one of the, the specialties of London. Is the, they, they have a special variant of the harbor, which is going to be very good. And you can see here, Stonehenge. I can't build Stonehenge. No stone available. I'm like, oh, I guess I'll build a granary. Boo. Maybe I'd already like discovered I couldn't build Stonehenge last turn. I don't remember last time it came around. Considering a holy site, because I thought it might be fun to build the religion. And then I think ultimately, well, do I build the builder? I do need some more units because there's gonna be there's gonna be some fighting going on here. Uh, I guess I did build the extra um, the extra warrior, but would not surprise me if I needed a little bit more than this as well. In the end. The map looks gorgeous. Love the way the game looks. Uh, very easy to identify almost everything going on here. Uh, the one thing, and I don't think, 
I don't know if I really show it off properly, is the lens mode. Just above the minimap, there's four buttons there. The one on the right is strategic map mode, which I will show off at some point. It looks gorgeous. I actually never used the strategic map mode in Civ 5. Um, for some reason, I didn't really like the look and I didn't find it that handy. I love, love, love the strategic map mode in Civ 6. I think it looks gorgeous and really clear what's going on. Um, the second icon from the right is the ability to drop a map pin, which is great. I don't remember what the third from the right is, that sort of folded sheet of paper. I'm afraid I don't remember it. But the one on the left is the lenses, which gives you a filter that um, highlights things on the map itself. Um, and it looks really good. And I've requested a filter to make it a little easier to tell improved resources from unimproved resources. Uh, because, I mean, this is a problem that goes back to, well, <laughs> like, as far back as you can think of in Civilization. You know, I'm sort of squinting and like, have I built a farm on this tile? No, I didn't. I mean, it actually didn't used to be so bad before, like, you were improving resources. But especially in Civ 5, and even with Civ 6 here, my old nan eyes are like, do I have a farm here? Do I have a mine on the copper? I don't know. So I'm like, please do this. I don't know if they'll have time to do that, but I'm like, I'm begging. I'm like, I have old man eyes. Please put an extra lens mode in there uh, for me. So we'll see if that happens. I don't know. Maybe someone can mod it in for me. The game, it, this is supposed to be the most moddable version of Civilization ever, which I am really pumped for. I mean, people did great modding for Civ 5, both in terms of gameplay balance, user interface, visuals, all kinds of things like that. And so I'm really looking forward to see what people do in Civ 6. Um, Especially if it's supposed to be the most moddable ever. Whatever that means. I mean, I don't know, Civ 5 seemed pretty damn moddable to me. I guess the one thing with Civ 5 is you did need to use, like, funny DLC tricks as opposed to actual mod tricks for some of the user interface improvements. Maybe you won't have to do that this time around. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. I still haven't met anyone yet. But, of course, my exploration has been a wee bit more limited uh, due to the fact that I'm having to do a heck of a lot of fighting. On the bright side... My warrior units are going to have a crap ton of experience and promotions before any real fighting comes out. Here you can see an example. The warrior cannot move into the forest to the south here because I only have one of two movement. And there's my builder unit. It's going to be a little bit hard up to get any building going on. And I think we just got to pop up about amenities. If you pause now and you look, and you won't hear my voice, but you can rewind. You look at the nameplate for London, the city plate, you can see amenities is at minus one currently. Also, housing capacity, four of six. So the maximum size of your city is limited based on your housing com uh, capacity. And amenities basically replaces happiness. There's no global happiness in Civ 6. There is local, you can think of it as local happiness or this amenities rating. Basically, people want, you know, a certain amount of entertainment and healthcare and plumbing and, and you know, whatever um, to make their life in these cities enjoyable. Historically, cities were just like absolute absolute cesspools um they they tended to have like negative natural growth and oh there's a hero eureka moment and we've met someone i am isis reborn i'm the living nile i'm cleopatra and an ally if you're worthy um so and that's represented here both by a combination of the housing cap and the amenities if you have negative amenities you produce less food and production if you have positive amenities then you actually get a bonus to those things um and you know at zero then it's even and as well as having the housing cap. You can raise the housing cap by building, like, farms not only give you more food, they count as, I think, half a unit of housing each, um, and a lot of the buildings give you a boost to housing or count as an amenity or two. Uh, the entertainment district is a plus one amenity, for example, because it makes people happier and more productive and just enjoying the city some more. So uh, London will definitely need a little bit of help to keep going. You can see, like, the barbarian swarm here is just being brutal. Uh, oh, we have an envoy at our disposal. We can use the envoy to, to talk to a city-state. We only need one, so we're clearly going to spend it on Jerusalem over here. Uh, envoy sent. And I'm like, oh, this is not the right screen for that. Although I did just notice, I think this is the first time here that I noticed the levy military button, which I don't remember if it was in the first build. We're going to look at that later on. There we go. Here's where we assign those. There's also a button in the bottom right that would have come up. So I have the extra envoy, so I send it to Jerusalem. Um, and... I started with one for free, I think because I was the first one to discover them, or it was the first one I discovered, one way or, or the other. Um, and by having one, it gives me some free faith per turn. When uh, If I get up to three envoys, there'll be another bonus uh, here. You, see, you can see the bonus earned over there. And if I go to Jerusalem, it'll tell me. So at level, with two envoys, it doesn't give me any added bonus. Well, that's not entirely true, because... The civilization that is the most influential with the city-state also counts as the suzerain, right? Basically, Jerusalem becomes a vassal 
of that person. You don't need to have six envoys or whatever. This will you'll you'll notice later on it will come up um, the the suzerain bonus kind of thing, and the suzerain can um, it the the, the city state can get pulled into war right, on your side, but also you can levy their units. You can take control over all their units for, well, in this build, which, again, these things might change, and this is quick speed and all sorts of things, in this build here is for 20 turns, and again, that could change a lot, but basically for 20 turns, I gain control over all of Jerusalem's units, which means city-state diplomacy is even more important than before. It was always useful to have a city-state on your side during a war, but the idea, but, the, you know, there were still AI units, so they were always of moderate usefulness, but now you get to take control of them for 20 turns. That's huge because you can actually coordinate those units with your efforts. And also, if you're like me, you tend to use them as sacrificial pawns to get stuff going on because, hey, they're not your units, right? Um, <laughs> that's fine. A really, really powerful ability, and you'll definitely see that come into play a little bit later on here. So again, here, I, you know, this, well, it makes sense with the river crossing. There's no way for me to double move and attack over here, but I'm trying to figure out the best way to deal with these damn warriors here. And don't worry, we'll get there. Plus, we're damaged currently, but it's going to be, it's going to take up a little bit of my attention at this time because I'm trying really hard not to lose any units. And in particular, I really want to do some work with this builder. If you don't know, by the way, builder is the replacement for workers. They've been renamed for more than simply, you know, just branding or whatever. But to, I think emphasize the fact that they really do work differently than before. Here you can see I just used um, uh, the builder to build the farm just because I couldn't really reach anything else and I thought it'd be fine. I mean, I knew that no one could reach the builder with the forest in the way there. Um, so builders have charges now, right? Workers in previous versions could, you know, you built them at 4,000 BC and they'd still be around in the year 2020, uh, which was a little bit ludicrous. So um, now they have charges and eventually they run out. You can see my builder here has one more build left. So they start off with three charges. Some There are some things that can modify how many charges they've got, but a builder can build three things and then it is, it's expired, it's done, and you have to build more. Um, in addition to that, they do build things instantly. Uh, both those things, the fact that there's a limited number of charges and the fact they build things instantly does actually feel like it reduces the micromanagement for the builders a lot. You just use them when you need them. You deal with them. You don't have like 20 of them running around forever. And one of the reasons they used to automate a lot, I mean, it's it's never a good idea. You're never supposed to, you're never quote unquote supposed to automate workers. You always want to manually run them because you can just make better decisions than the AI ever can because you know your own plans and you can optimize things appropriately. But I often found it to be very boring. And so, and tedious. So after a certain point, I would always automate things. Here's me sending out an unescorted settler because, you know, what could possibly go wrong by doing that? Um, and, but here, there's going to be less reason to do it because you're not going to end up with 20 workers down the road and they're not going to last forever. So you're only going to have, have one or two builders probably going around and they build things very quickly. Not only that, they are no longer responsible for building roads. Trade units automatically build roads. So any traders you send from one city to another will automatically build a road along the way, which is very, very cool. And later on, you can actually develop military engineers, which are specialized units that let you build roads as well as do a few other things. So there are still ways to manually build roads, but your workers, your builders aren't really responsible for doing that. There we go. Someone has built Stonehenge because, well, I couldn't. So good on you, whoever the heck that was. Congratulations. Uh, I'm not bitter at all, really. <clears throat> um... Yeah, so anyway, so that's that. But right now I'm a little stuck with the builder. I really want to go and improve the wheat, but I can't. I can't improve the grapes yet because I think I need calendar still for a plantation. But I really want to improve the wheat, but I can't get there. Craftsmanship is done, unlocking a couple of new civics, a, new, a couple of new policies unlocked by the civic. But again, I'm, I think I'm going to stick with urban planning at this time. Um, I don't remember what, there we go because I really want to get the plus five strength when fighting barbarians. Discipline is such an amazing bonus early on. It is critical because um, you you really don't have a lot of strength on your units. Getting a plus five on there, like uh, the warrior's melee strength is 20. So I'm improving my combat strength against barbarian by 25%, which is pretty honking huge at this phase in the game. So we're going to go ahead and put a cut in here. Hopefully you're enjoying this. We'll be back in uh, next episode with some more coverage here of Civilization VI as I'm being swarmed by barbarians and sending out an unescorted settler. That's what could possibly go wrong, right? Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.